Okay, so we had uh, this topic that was uh, left over from the previous weeks, uh, and uh, as some of you noticed, it was uh, present in the, in the lab solution, so I would spend some time in describing, uh, in describing it, and so we can uh, then, uh, let's say, use it uh, in our code. Basically, you remember what we said about promises, now where a pro the, uh, the promise object mainly also, um, by, by handling promises, we need to provide uh, callbacks for the then and the catch uh, cases, okay? Um, and so, a promise will standardize uh, all the way in which an asynchronous callback is executed, so we, don't, we no, no longer need uh, to know whether, I don't know, a SQLite requires a second parameter, or which kind, and so on, how the error is returned in a custom way, but the promise object just uh, uh, works in the same way for every uh, library that we use, okay? So they will standardize it. But uh, it doesn't prevent us from uh, um, the need of creating many small callbacks, okay? So if we can change the operations, then it's okay. The result of a promise becomes uh, the body of the second, the and the result of the second becomes the body of the third one, and so on. Hmm? By, uh, by, by the property that every uh, method will return a promise again hmm? with the result uh, that it just computed. If the library is well designed, we can do that. Hmm? Um, but uh, it will always we will still require us uh, to fragment our code. Okay, so like like we were saying bef before. Okay, imagining that you want to increase uh, like uh, well, uh, at the um, the score of the data from the web page from the front end. So we have one piece of code uh, where you extract the current value or the current answers. Then you need to call the server for calling the VOTAP API, and you need to wait for the server to respond. That will be an asynchronous call. So the rest of the operation, like uh, uh, updating the screen, can only happen in the then clause of the asynchronous operation that was useful to call the API. It will we will learn it is called fetch, you know, the, the, the function for calling external API in JavaScript is called fetch. So the fetch returns a promise and we must wait for the completion of this promise. And especially if we uh, are doing it twice, okay, so we have the code, we find the answer, we call an API for increasing the score. Then, so with the resolution of this promise, we uh, read, we want to read the new score. So we, mu we must call a second API, and in the then of this second API, we can finally update the interface. So we have a one API call in the body of another API call and so on. Uh, the async and await instructions are a language construct to, um, let's say, hide from the syntax point of view all of this uh, complexity of the then and catch uh, instructions. Basically, you can see async and await as a replacement, as a different syntax for doing more or less what we do with catch and, uh, um, and then uh, with the promises. Uh, what do they do? They are, these are keyword uh, syntax, uh, syntax, keywords in the language, in the JavaScript language. So async is a keyword that you can use when you define a function. In the four ways you can define a function, you can define them as an async function. So it will be an async function, async function expression, or async arrow function. The difference is that when you define an async function, that function will automatically return a promise. Will automatically create and return a promise. Even if I'm writing just a simple function, return three, that function will 
be transformed by the async keyword into a function that returns a promise that resolves to three. And every exception that may happen inside the async function will be transformed into the rejection of this promise. Okay, so basically if we write some, let's just open some code randomly uh, here. If I write an uh, async function uh, hi, okay, and I return uh, four, actually what this function is doing is uh, hidden behind the async keyword is create new promise, okay, and call promise in the, like, okay, let's make the equivalent. It's the same as writing function i, function i2, okay, with, uh, by creating new promise, return, sorry, new promise, with uh, uh, resolve, reject, and in the body of this promise, we just have return four. These two are the same function. Okay, so whenever we need to cre create a function that returns a promise, we can use this. And uh, if this function would maybe throw an exception, uh, error, then it's the same as uh, these promises, uh, uh, sorry, not return for, my mistake, resolve for. There's no return from a promise. Okay, the return, the return value is not used. Resolve is when you have the result and you call it so that it can be returned and cache and caught by the dang statement. Okay, so it's a stupid promise because a promise with, that resolves immediately to a number, but it's not forbidden. No, normally you do something asynchronous so they have to wait. In this case, we don't have to wait. We just can. We already know the answer. Okay, and. Uh, in a, in a async function, whenever an error happens, or either because we're throwing the error itself, or because some operation inside creates a division by zero, or a find not found, or whatever, it's equivalent to rejecting the promise with this error. With the same argument, okay? So we know that the promise can output the result either to the, to the then with the resolve, or to the catch with the reject. The same is done in a normal, in a sync function, but the resolve method is just a simple return, and uh, reject is just a simple exception. So we are using the mechanism of synchronous programming, returning values or creating exception, to actually return asynchronous values, because this is an asynchronous values, value. Okay? Function high returns a promise. This means that you can write high.then and do something, because it's a promise. So you can use this, so they are totally equivalent. In both cases, what really happens is uh, promise objects. These are just different syntaxes. One is the explicit syntax of managing the promise object, and the other is uh, an automatic conversion of a nearly sequential function that is wrapped into a promise. But then you have a promise, so you, can, you, uh, you cannot write, sorry, it's not hide then, but I call the function, the result is a promise, then then. Uh, you cannot print the result of hide. Right? Will not be four. If you print high, console.log high, we will return promise object. If you want to see the four, you have to um, 
console.log, sorry, the result can be printed here. Like with a normal promise. Okay, so let's, uh, there was a question, yes? Yeah. Yes, yes. No, because what, what you're actually doing is, uh, if I understand it correctly, you have a promise, okay, and in the body of the, of the promise, uh, you are using some synchronous callback. And from that synchronous callback, uh, you call the resolve, uh, or maybe also synchronous in that case, yes. Uh, yes, it can be done because you are, say, again, with a Closure, the inner callback, which we we'll call the resolve method in the promise. You can, you can do that. Um, with the async syntax, you, you need to use chaining in that case. So you will have a, um, the callback defined as another async function that will return first, and then you return the result of that, that function. It will be something like return await function. Uh, okay, so this, uh, let me try to save it and see if it works. Test.mjs. Okay, if I node test.mjs. Okay, it's printing a four, okay? It's a normal. So this is a, 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 a simple syntax. Await does the, the contrary. Huh? Await is a um, keyword that you could, can put in front of um, a synchronous operation, in front of a promise, an expression whose value is a promise, and that you know calls the then method and returns the result uh, of the method itself, of, of, the, of the value itself. Okay? So, if, here, if I wanted to print the four, the number, the, the result here, I need to define a callback. And so everything we can do with the result should be inside this callback. Can never go inside, outside. So, uh, what we all uh, many times say, that in line eight and nine, that there's nothing useful to do. Because the result is not available. Okay, uh, the await instruction can be used in front of any promise. So, for example, also the promise returned by this function i, but also i two which returns a, which bits a promise. So, in, in the traditional way, hmm? doesn't matter. They're fully interchangeable. And what it does is. Uh, Creates the promise, calls the function, so create the promise, waits for the promise to complete, and then await returns its value. So I can do like uh, uh, const uh, result2, and then console.log result2. And it should print another 4 in this case. So these two operations are equivalent. This one is clearly asynchronous. The second one is also asynchronous because the await keyword stops the execution, you know, like cutting your function in two parts, one before the await and the other after the await, and the second part of the await is put automatically, let's say, into a callback. But syntactically, they are on the same block, 
on the same level. Hmm? So in this way, with the await keyword, we can have code that uh, does some computation with the result of a previous promise in the same function where we call the promise itself and not in the callback of the function. So we have the, the sort of, let's say, automatic creation of the callback. And it looks like in the same context. So it's very convenient, especially if we have to call a promise, uh, wait for the result, and then on the result do something else that calls a second promise and so on and so forth. And instead of having a callback instead of a callback or changing the, the promises, we just have a wait, a wait, a wait. Uh, and we should be aware that await means uh, stopping this function and waiting for the asynchronous operation to complete, uh, getting the results and executing the rest of the function as the callback of the previous one. Like here, here is clear. Here is the same. It's, be, it's behaving in the same way. But syntactically it looks like it looks simpler. No, it's more straightforward. It seems that we are await, we are stopping the execution until that promise is fulfilled. Okay? And then, if everything goes well, uh, we can continue. So instead of chaining promises, then, dot, then, dot, then, we can just write a sequential statement. Let me call them sequential, but we know they are not really sequential. Okay? Sequential looking statements. An await statement, uh, by definition, can only be written inside an async function, of course. Because if I have a wait, uh, then my code is asynchronous, and so the only result that my function can give is a promise. I cannot give you a result right now because I don't have it. Okay, so a wait can only be used, okay, at the top level like I did here, but normally inside a async function. It's forbidden. If I write a wait here, something, it will give me a syntax error. A wait expression are only allowed within a sync function and a top level module. Okay. So if you, uh, it's quite, I'm telling you because this, the error message is quite strange. Huh? Because the, the, the syntax validity of, a, of an instruction depends on the definition of the function. Basically, putting a sync in front of the function changes the syntax of the coding, the syntax rules of the code inside the function. That's why it's, it's defined as a, because the interpreter interprets this function in a totally different way. It gives you familiar syntax, but of course, it, the work for interpreting the function is totally different. So the syntax is interpreted in a different way. So you get a, a syntax error here. And you don't get a syntax error there, maybe. It's just a warning that the code is not reachable, okay? But uh, it's possible to use a wait because we are inside an async function. So that's the uh, normal limitation, which is reasonable, okay? Um, <clears throat> so a sync can be written in, uh, in front uh, of any function and transform that into an implicit promise. Uh, and the wait uh, is in front of an expression, any expression in the language. So it's an operator await. No, it's not a statement by itself. And this expression should have a promise value. If it's not a promise value, it's basically converted into a promise that is immediately resolved, so useless. Um, by the way, what happens if uh, we have an exception out of the promise? Because await uh, only gives me the good result. Well, the good point is that the exception thrown by a promise or the exception thrown by a function is transformed into an exception at the higher level. So we can do like this. Try and then catch the exception.
Hmm? So it, go, it works both ways. In a, a sync function, a return means uh, resolve, a throw or an exception means reject. In an await instruction, the resolve returns a result, the reject creates an exception. So basically, if we throw this exception here, it will reject the current promise, and this implicit promise is here, is read by the await statement and will generate a new exception. So the await will throw the exception starting from the promise rejection. So whether you do a throw here or a reject there, the promise in both cases, if you're using it as a promise, you can catch it. If you're using it as an await, you can try catch it. So we are reusing this, the um, sequencer syntax made of returns of throw and try catch and expressions to do the exam, exactly same operation that we could do with the dang and catch methods of, of the promises. Catch, I can write it on cat, G H error something. Okay. Um, so like this, uh, we have a very simple promise that just sets a timeout and resolves after two seconds. Does not, doesn't do anything, but resolves after two seconds. And we have a, a, a function with an await of the, for the result of this uh, function. Actually, the second console log will happen two seconds after the first one. Okay, so an async function breaks the rule that the code of a function is always executed at once, altogether. Like we always say, it, okay? When I begin a function, the execution will go up to the end. It cannot be interrupted. This is no longer true in an async function. It can be interrupted if we use await inside. Okay, it will be interrupted when I say it, of course, in, in an explicit point. So that's the only way of uh, having two logs uh, separated by, uh, by an, an amount of time, okay? Two. The second one may only happen in the callback. The callback is hidden in the awaiting structure. So uh, just be careful. It's very convenient, very easy syntax, okay? Uh, just be careful of the functions you're doing. When you have a normal function, it always runs together. All the instructions will run together. If you have an async function, it may not be true. So it means that also some values that you're relying on may, be, may have changed in the meantime. Hmm? You cannot assume that you are the only one using those variables. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, and okay, this is an, another example where we are mixing the await syntax with the promise syntax. We have an async function, it returns a promise. If you return something from the promise, okay, of course, number one await, so it processes another promise, and a, a return is normally it automatically converted into the resolution of a promise. So we are mixing, it's the same concept, there's nothing new, the syntax is different, no? and it's also more compact. Uh, okay, we have some comparison before and after, where I see that chaining of promises is simply converted into a, a sequence of, uh, of awaits uh, normally. And always remember to put an async in front of that. Okay. Um, so where is that? Okay, so this also solves <laughs> one of the problems that we had, uh, remember when uh, the first time we talked about asynchronous operations, we said how to make uh, the increase in count of the numbers uh, 
the, the total is not correct because the methods are run concurrently. Well, the, the cleanest part is uh, using, uh, using a weight. It's very easy to sequentialize uh, some code that could be, that runs asynchronously, but you can manage it, it in a for instruction, uh, instruction, for example, which is a strongly synchronous context. So they, they rely on the same mechanism, but some, for some operation promises are better. For example, the, the, what, you, uh, what your uh, friend was telling of uh, being able to resolve a, a promise from within a callback, a nested callback can only be done with promises, otherwise you need to chain the value up to the, to the different levels. You cannot punch through the levels. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you can have a, a sequential control of, sorry, yes, a synchronous control of, a of asynchronous operations and uh, you can do that easily with await. It will be much more complex to do that with promises. So it's, it's, it's good uh, to be able to learn both, uh, both uh, um, let's say, uh, syntaxes. And so this leads us to revisiting probably our <coughs> server. Okay, uh, since there were some, some, some questions, um, maybe we can try, no, uh, with this new also knowledge, uh, new syntax also try to implement some, uh, some other API, okay? So, um, for example, to, the, to, get, to do something more complex, uh, let's try to implement uh, you know, the addition of a new question. Okay? It's a post that receives some information and creates a, a new question with zero answers, and the server will assign an ID and timestamp it with the current date. And so it may return maybe the new ID. Okay, or the new ID with the, the, all the information about the, the question. Okay, so let's try to implement this, uh, this functionality. First of all, the API, okay, the endpoint uh, should be, sorry, uh, let me keep this open, and in server, we create a new endpoint, it will be a post of uh, uh, questions, that's it, okay? We are posting an object to questions. Res, uh, request response, and then our call. So from a high level point of view, what we should do is uh, we not, must extract the information from the request insert data into the database and then return the result return the, the object okay uh, first of all extract the information from the um, from the request is uh, in request dot body should contain uh, the body parsed from the JSON code. Okay, so the uh, object of the request of the, the question, which is a partial question, should be inside request.body. Let's check it so that we see actually what is passed to this function. Okay, let's try to execute this post. Uh, let me run the server, and in test.http, let's try to post to this address, okay? So if I send a post like this, it will send a post with an empty body. And of course, the body will be empty. This is being printed by the API. So the syntax here too is to add an empty line with the, the HTTP extension, with the REST client extension, is to have an empty line and then the body 
in form of a, of a string. Basically. And uh, uh, in this case, uh, it would be uh, two attributes. Sorry, let me check the readme, text and email. Okay, let's just copy this. Okay, so if I send this, I still get an empty body. So what is happening? What is happening is that uh, I'm sending a body in JSON format, but the server doesn't know that it's in JSON format because the request doesn't tell me that the rest that the body is formatted in JSON. So the parsing of the body doesn't happen. Body is an empty object because we have the JSON middleware. Did we install it? Yes. We installed the JSON middleware, but the JSON middleware is not executed if the request doesn't contain the declaration that the, the body is, is in JSON, actually. So we should add a, a header, content type, application, JSON. So in this case, lucky me, the server actually passed the request through the JSON middleware that extracted from the body the actual object. So if, if you forget that, you are not in the client, you are not uh, uh, telling the server to extract the body content from JSON. Okay, so that's one nasty, it's not a, a bug, but it's something nasty to find. Well, my body is empty, what did I do wrong? Yeah, maybe you forgot the content type. Okay? So, uh, if you set the content type correctly, then the object that you get in request.body will be exactly the same object that you serialize here in JSON. Remember, it should be JSON, okay, because if, for, if you forget uh, the quotes here, well, nobody will be happy, okay? Because uh, uh, JSON syntax is stricter than the JavaScript syntax. Okay. Hmm. Okay, then the response. The response should contain the new ID of the inserted object or some kind of error code if the new ID couldn't be created. So first of all, uh, at, at this point, sorry, uh, okay, we have here, this is synchronous, okay, we extracted the body. In this callback uh, right now, uh, the request uh, is, a, is, a, is an object that has already been parsed by the middleware, and so it can extract information in a synchronous way. Then I need to interrupt the, the database. Uh, I don't know if the DAO already contains something for adding a new question. We have a get question. We have a not question. Yeah. That we can use. So let's review what add question is doing. We need to call it, okay? So add question, of course, returns a promise. Uh, It does a first select because uh, the, uh, the argument uh, is the user email, but you need, it needs an ID no, for the primary key. So it does some work. And at the end, it runs uh, this query. So to insert text, author ID, and date in the table, only three fields because the ID is automatically incremented. Okay, should be automatically incremented. And we may know about the, uh, the, the number that has been assigned to this auto-incremented value with this attribute last ID. Okay, so this is the, an implementation where, okay, the first query is just to uh, retrieve the ID starting from email. The second query is for actually inserting the, the values. And the new fee, a new uh, ID is generated and returns last ID. 
and this is another source of error that whenever we use, uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, attributes of, of this in the SQLite uh, library, that this keyword okay, is not defined when, you use, uh, when we, we create an arrow function. So this, that's the only real difference between an arrow function and a normal function, that an arrow function doesn't have an object in which it, it runs. It, it uses the object in which it's contained. It's lighter, let's say. It doesn't create a context, a local context, okay? And uh, so if I write uh, this dot list ID in an arrow function, the, the keyword this would refer to the external function, like this one. And it will not, well, well hey, okay. The external function is, uh, yes, the add question one. While uh, I want uh, this to refer to this function. Because the query that I've been running, I want the result uh, of the last ID for this query, okay? And the only way to create that, uh, this object, is to use function instead of an error function. So what you, what you, this is the reason, it's not just a, a choice. In this case, I must use the function syntax for defining this callback and not the arrow syntax. So that this function will be the context to which a to attach to this variable. So the ending of this is quite complex if you want. There are some tutorials for that, but you know, the, the key point is that if you are using this inside a callback, this callback should be declared as a function and not as an arrow. Not just simply with the arrow the syntax. Otherwise, you will find that this is null, is undefined, sorry, not null, it's undefined, and this last idea will give an error. This was in the slide, but it was subtle, say, in this, case, in this specific case. So, um, this function is written as a nested callback, okay? Because we have a first query, and in the callback of the first query, we have a second query. And the, sec the callback of the second query finally resolves uh, the initial promise. This is one way of writing the code. Another way could have been to chain two promises. Okay, the first promise, the first function, the first block would just have a, a promise that returns the ID of the user. And then chaining to the first promise, we, do have, we, are, we have the second query, we could implement the second query that does the insert. Okay, so that it will be more sequential or chained instead of nested. And then finally, on the result of the second query, we can resolve the initial, the, the, the bigger promise. So there is a the different style of writing. When we wrote this code, we only knew about callbacks, basically, and we were just learning about promises. But let's keep this function as it is, and let's use it. No? For use it, uh, uh, what we can do here is Right now it's called uh, the add question, okay? So we can have add question that receives uh, two parameters, right? No, a question object from which it will extract email and text and date. So this function is not documented, so I'm sorry. It requires a question object with a property email, a property text, and a property date. Row ID is computed by itself, the user ID. So um, we must provide a, an object like this. So is it this object? No, not yet. Because we have a text, we have an email, we don't have a date. So we could patch this object, for example. So we can add to the question, the date, a new attribute of, does, does it need to be a string or DJS object? Let's see. It requires a DJS object because it's calling to the two iso string method. 
So the day j is for, for now, okay. We just create now as a date object. And now we can pass this object a question to the method at question of, of our DAO. Uh, how did import it? Okay, get question, add question. And it imported from the DAO. And this is a promise. Okay, so I created the parameters. Uh, some parameters come from the user. Email and uh, uh, text. Some parameter comes from the server. We know what day it is. And some value, the ID, will come from the database. In the long run, we will not uh, provide the email of the user. Uh, in an API, in a real website, uh, you cannot uh, send uh, a new answer for anybody. When you send an answer, it will be your answer. So the email uh, will be extracted from the authentication that you will make. Right now we don't have the website and we don't have the authentication yet. But the idea is that uh, if the server is accepting your API call, it already knows who you are especially if you're modifying something. So you don't need to repeat the information about you. We will know how to extract the user information from the user authentication. It will be the last week of the course when we do the authentication. So uh, if I want to be sure who the author of, the answer, of that answer is, I need to take information from the login phase of the user. Otherwise, I could log in with one name and send an answer with a different name. Uh, faking, a, say, a, a different user, the answer for a different user. It can be useful if you are, you know, a user that can actually, is authorized to, put, uh, to, to post answers uh, on behalf of others, but uh, not normally. So right now we don't have this mechanism and we have the user explicit. But normally, when you post a new answer, uh, automatically you get the score zero, the date of today, and the user yourself. That's it. Hmm? So we will need to, to change this in some way. Um, okay, the result, uh, I don't know how to turn it off, sorry. Uh, uh, the result uh, of the ask question is a promise, like we said. Okay? And uh, uh, we can use the await statement to say the DID, the ID of the response. And this requires, of course, you see, it's a syntax error because we need to declare this callback as an asynchronous function. Uh, sorry, async is before the arguments. You see that when I put async, the syntax error disappears. Uh, and a sync function is not something strange, okay? It's a normal function that returns a promise. So there's nothing wrong in using an async function as a callback. As long as the return value of this function is not used. Okay, we don't have any return statement here. This function will close with a response.send, okay? There's no meaningful return value from this function. If there was a return value in the original function, it will be transformed into a promise. Okay, so it depends on, uh, okay, the, in this case we have add.post post that doesn't expect any return value at all. But if the function that accept the callback would uh, require a function that returns an integer, for example, you cannot make that asynchronous because an async will, not, will never return an integer, will always return a promise. We'll see one case of that when you do reacting, which in some context, the, the return value of a, of, a, of a callback is significant. 
Normally, callbacks uh, are not expected to return anything because they're expected to work asynchronously, okay? So there's nothing special we create in a sync function. Just be aware it returns a promise. And it allows you to use a waiting sign. And once we have ID, we can just return uh, in the, re the response uh, JSON, an object uh, with the, so the, the specification told us, let's go to the readme, ID with the number. Okay, let's put, sorry, the ID with the number ID. So this is the variable and these are the name of the property. That JSON will take the object, serialize it into JSON, and send it to the response. And uh, will close uh, the request response call. Okay? So let's see if it works. I'm saving the file and trying to send this request again. Uh, and it didn't work. App crashed. Why? DJS is not defined. Okay. That was easy. We didn't import JJS at the beginning. Yeah. Import DJS from DJS. I'm not sure if it's defined in the project. Let's look at the packet, the JSON dependencies. Yeah, it's there. It should be there. So I now we save it. Import DJS from DJS. Ah, oh, no, sorry. It was not in the main file. Well, let's keep it here also. It was not in the, uh, okay, yeah. Okay. So let's try to restart the post. It happens sometimes. Okay, so what happened here is that this was the console log of the body that was received, okay? This is the logging of the Morgan middleware that tells me that I received a post and the result was 200, yay. And the result, uh, uh, the response body, oops, is this one. ID, error, auto not available, there's something wrong here. Okay, I need to, de to debug this. So I, what I did here was to return an object with a property ID. The problem is that the result of ID is not the actual, oh, it's not the actual value because something went wrong. So let's go and debug that. Auto not available, check the inserted email. Let's go to the DAO and see what was wrong. Ah, okay, the email was user, to, oh, sorry, yeah, stupid me. The email was not valid according to the current data, user database. There's no user with that email. Uh, probably resolving as an error is not a good idea. That was one, something that it was not. So it's probably better to reject with an error. So before we fix the error, let's fix the, the handling of the error itself. So that the error message is not, is not mistaken from the result value. And this means that in the server, we can do this, but we can also catch this exception. So if everything is okay, we return the ID, but if something goes wrong, we wrap this into a try-catch statement where we can manage catch the exception, where we can return the exception object. What the response 
should be, will be status code uh, 500 dot uh, JSON exception object. So in this case, we'll return a 500 status code instead of 200 status code and with the error object instead of the ID object. I hope, SI. No, there's something wrong again. Status code is not a function, or oh, sorry, what was that? The, no, because status code is the property, sorry. It's the current status code. Uh, status, maybe. It's a method. Yeah, maybe status, 500. Okay. Okay, so I sent a request that still contains the problem that the, the email is not valid. And in this case, the, the response, so it didn't crash anymore, the response was uh, at a 500 uh, response code. And the body will contain the error message. It's no longer wrapped into the ID. Mm -hmm. So it's cleaner. And I manage this by no, catching or handling the rejection of the promise with a try catch because I'm using the await async uh, syntax. Uh, finally, I can uh, try to put a valid email. Uh, oh, I don't have the, the exception anymore. Probably. This should be one of those. Yeah. So I put a valid email in this case, and so it will return me ID 3. So it's the third question. And if I click send again, it returns a new ID every time. So in this case, we have the same question over and over again because the text is the same. The date is recomputed every time, and the ID is generated a new for a new for every request. Uh, that's it. Okay, you see the ID is increasing. It is just a number that is guaranteed to be different uh, and tends to increase. Uh, of course, if you delete the, 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 the content of the table, the number will not return to zero. It's not a counter, it's just an incremental number, so it will always increase. It will never reset to zero, and sh we shouldn't care about that. Okay. Uh, it's just an, an idea. It saves time for us to, to manage the idea ourselves. Okay, so uh, we have three points here. How to manage the post uh, uh, stay, uh, requests. How to exploit the await and async syntax to make it simpler. We could do the same thing also in the DAO if you want to refactor it with the await and async, but it's already working, so... Let's not touch it. How to manage it in a very simple way, the errors. We didn't do any error passing at the beginning and any validation here. Okay, they should all, we just are assuming that the question contains the right fields. We should do some checks also here. And we know what to do. Where something's wrong, we just respond with an error code. And uh, yeah. And finally, the other thing that we saw in this exercise was, uh, say, incrementally getting the information you need. So in the database, we have four columns, uh, and we extracted this column from four different places. The question really comes from the user. The user email should come in the future from the authentication, from the login. The date comes from the server, and the ID comes from the database. Okay, so the object contains all four information, but the uh, source of this information, we should reason about that uh, 
uh, we, we just don't assume that the, the API are just a way to read and write uh, in a transparent way the table or database. We cannot read all the fields, and we cannot modify all the fields as we want through an API. The API should make sense. Does it make sense for an API to change the ID, to force the date? We decide. Probably not. And so the API should not offer the possibility of doing illegal operations. That doesn't make sense. Huh? It's not just exposing everything you can do with my table, you can do it with my API. No. We select which operation makes sense and which operation we can offer to our client. Okay? So, of course, we will join again this small API server in probably four weeks when, or five when we will attach it to our front end in React. So for today, that's all. And uh, yeah, we still have uh, one yeah, the lab this week and this next, next week. Uh, remember that the 25th is holiday, so we'll skip one lab in the 25th. Okay, thank you.